this year and goes into effect January 1 on 2022. Once again, it's an attempt to improve access to care, but it's a stepwise process. And I would submit to you today that we have to be more bold in our decision and policy making to ensure that we don't have, we don't wait another 20 or 30 years before we reach a point in the history of this country where people have equal access to care across the board. The history's there. Go back to the report that was written in 1938. Go back to Dr. Lewis Sullivan's Healthy People's Report of 1989-1990, and the documentation is all there. We need to move rapidly to a point in time where we have equal access to care across the board without these, uh, if what I consider, you know, just minute steps along the way. I've been in this business for 40 years, and it has gradually been just that, a stepwise process and to access to care. And if I can, let me, um, let me go ahead and bring this back to our communities, right? Because we mentioned some of these policies that are overarching that really should be um, implemented uh, at the federal level so that it affects everyone. But within our communities, um, how is it that we help alleviate a lot of these potential perspectives that Latinos have against the black community and that the black community has against Latinos in order to really help bridge that divide? Because we have seen that, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there is the pitting against one another sometimes does solidify into acts of violence or uh, hesitation against one another. We saw that here last year. Um, we, we were seeing it right after uh, the protests that were happening. Um, my brother, Berto Aguayo, mentioned this a couple, a couple days ago, um, you know, that he noticed, we all noticed how there were some people uh, that wanted to rile themselves up against other communities here in Chicago. So bringing it back to our communities, um, Senator Villanueva, how do we help bridge and alleviate those negative and toxic perceptions that are not the case? So it's really interesting that you brought up the situation because I was actually out there. Um, I live in Little Village and I represent Little Village and North Lawndale, which is a predominantly African-American community. Uh, black community is, it, we're, we're actually one Lawndale because it's South Lawndale, North Lawndale, but South Lawndale eventually went on to become Little Village. Um, but the reality is we're neighbors because even though there's a viaduct that divides us, like the reality is you see Mexican people who live on the side of the viaduct and you see black folks living on this side of the viaduct, like, it, it, like we're interspersed. Um, there's a couple of things that I actually want to talk about, and this has to do with where I'm going right now, about what uh, Director Story was talking about. So the Senate bill that he's talking about, 1840, was actually one of the Black Caucus pillars in the General Assembly, and this was a health care pillar. Um, so in response to the, the sentiment of what's happening, obviously the past year and a half in our country, actually way longer than that, but what we saw kind of reach a pinnacle last summer um, was obviously the protest because of the George Floyd murder. Um, and we saw a lot of tensions in the community, um, and I'll go back to that as, as kind of like, where do we go from here? Um, but the Black Caucus in the General Assembly um, and me having worked both in the House and the Senate came together and said we, we need to advance major legislation in some major areas. One of the caucuses had to do with criminal justice, which really, really dug in deep um, on criminal justice reform on some major issues. One of the other ones had to do with education. Um, there was another one in terms of economic development, and then there was another one in terms of healthcare, which is the one that Director Shorey was talking about, 1840, that we just passed this year. Um, and again, this happened because of the leadership of the Black Caucus, but we, as members of the Latino Caucus, stood with our brothers and sisters of the Black Caucus and said, we're there with you to get this done. 
um, because we understand the impact that is not just going to have on um, black communities, but we understand the impact that it's going to have on our communities. And I remember this because there were very serious conversations where, especially because a lot of the, the Latino representatives that are both in the House and the Senate on the state level are a lot younger. We have younger members that are coming from a perspective where our, our experiences are very much um, multicultural. Like I, I went to a predominantly African American high school in Hyde Park here in Chicago. So growing up, all my friends were not Mexican. They were not Latinos. All my friends, literally up until the point that I went to college, everybody that I knew was black. Um, and that was where I was coming from because even though I lived in Little Village, I didn't go to school in Little Village, so I wasn't surrounded by, by, by peers who looked like me. My peers had a different experience, but that opened me up and opened up my eyes to all different types of worlds that existed outside of just my neighborhood in Little Village. So for me, I've always carried that, but you have a lot of younger leaders who are coming in who carry those same similarities because our existences are very multicultural, very multiracial. So of course, we were gonna stand up with our brothers and sisters of the Black Caucus and say, we're gonna be there with you. Additionally, as kind of all of this is happening, we're seeing obviously the tensions overflow in black and brown communities. And it wasn't just Little Village in North Lawndale, there were issues everywhere. Because again, going back to the fact that a lot of Latino communities are literally right next to black communities. Like that's how we live in Chicago. Um, I was out in the streets and I remember this because I, again, I live in Little Village, we're all connected, everybody knows each other. And we started seeing a lot of stuff that was bubbling up particularly on social media and particularly on Facebook. Um, the thing that we have in Little Village and in North Lawndale and some other the, their neighborhoods in Chicago, which is one of the reasons why I'm such a big proponent of putting money towards violence prevention and not just by saying like, oh, we're going to do this or we're going to do that, but by actually putting money into the programs that actually work is because I literally saw this happen where we have violence, they're not even violence interrupters, they're, they're peacekeepers. They are young people and sometimes not so young people, um, young and hard uh, individuals who are from the community who have lived the experiences of either being in gangs or coming from, from that experience that are now doing the work of keeping the peace in our communities and who were literally there as stuff was happening to help calm things down and do the intervention that was necessary both in black communities and Latino communities and then bring all of those young people together to have real di dialogues and conversations about why it is that a lot of the powers that be want you all to do this to each other because they benefit from this. They benefit from our communities being separated. They benefit from us on the idea that we hate each other even though we don't because we don't all know each other but I saw it literally happening in action that in 24 hours, those peacekeepers were able to not only like bring the tensions down, but to also say and bring people together and have them together. And I saw this because 26th Street was cut off at a certain point. There were cops in every intersection that were cutting all of Little Village, not just 26th Street, but on 31st, on Pulaski, on the bigger streets. I was riding around the neighborhood because again, this is, this is my background. And the guys and the women, because it was, it, was, it was men and women were out there having the conversations on a very personal level with young people from Latino, Latinx communities and from black communities to say, this is not the way. We could do so much more together. And I saw it happening in real time and that's where we need to be going is we need to stop thinking that everything is so complicated and really getting back to having dialogues with people because honestly, like hold here right now, I did write it down in terms of break times. Like that's where real powerful legislation that has real impact from our communities comes from, from conversations and from people saying, hey, I live this experience. I know that the trabajadores at the, at the, the fabricas need another break time because they're not even really getting that first break time. But that's where it really comes from. And honestly, like I, I've seen it in action and that's what's actually gonna help us make the changes that we need to see. Thank you for that. Uh, and yes, I uh, definitely agree with that. I think uh, you know, violence prevention is something that is um, an area that really needs to get funded. And so thank you for the work that you did here in uh, Illinois uh, because Governor Pritzker just signed 
um, in order to really be able to pump in a lot of money into our communities, over $250 uh, million uh, for gun and violence prevention. So it is programs like that that really bring the youth together, uh, mobilize them, and that allow them to talk and have these different conversations and dialogues um, in order to really help bridge that divide. Um, Can I piggyback on what the senator said? Sure. Uh, just very quickly, I would just like to piggyback on what the senator's comments about SB 1840 and how our legislators, black and brown people, have worked together. I think that that's what we have to do is to allow the leaders at all levels, those influencers, to demonstrate how black and brown people work together to achieve a defined outcome. And this bill is an example of that how they coalesced around an initiative that will benefit all people of color. And I think going back to what Jose said about work, work is an equalizer. If we can continue to rise, you know, push up, you know, the minimum wage, it benefits all of our communities. That's the good news. I think that we, we as people have to work to identify initiatives that will immediately show results and have a positive impact on the lives of those that we love. And I applaud the senator and her colleagues for doing just that with SB 1840. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Jorge, uh, on this topic of you know uh, really being able to curve and fix a lot of these perceptions, uh, you and I, we talked uh, a couple of days ago, and you know, we talked about racism and how that's prevalent in the in the workforce um, in different companies. Um, what are some solutions that you think, or where are some com where is some common ground that we talked about education and kind of coming in, but what is that common ground that in work settings, black and brown communities um, can really work? to dismantle that racism? I think, I think that takes a lot of education. Uh, employers usually pit worker against worker. You know, and, and, and when there's a, a racial difference, obviously this way to, to disorganize workers is more effective. So we see the tendencies in African-American uh, workers to say to immigrants, go back to your country because you are competing with me. You're taking jobs away from me. That's, it, it is not true, but it is the discourse that has been sold to the African-American community. And then we see on the immigrant community, Latino, I'm going to speak most predominantly, uh, the idea that, oh, African-Americans are lazy because they are citizens. You know, they can work less, and uh, there's favoritism in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. And I think our labor, or part of our job, is to educate both communities in the very simple fact that the enemy is not your co-worker. The enemy is the employer. You know, the employer is the one deciding the wages. The employer is deciding the working conditions. The employer is the one exercising favoritism, if there's any. You know, so go against the employer, unite it and go against the employer. Don't, 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 don't allow the employer to pit each other, you know, and, 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 and destroy possibilities of improving uh, workplace conditions, etc. And obviously laws, you know, when, when, when you establish laws and you actually enforce them, uh, you benefit both populations at the same time and everyone else. So labor laws, if, if you, the, the example I was referring to, you know, if you, if you pass a law on domestic workers, then that's going to benefit both populations. But we have to educate people in the existence of that law, you know, and we have to have mechanisms to enforce. And if there are not enough mechanisms to enforce, then we have to give people the ability to self-enforce. Uh, we've been talking for a year about uh, some proposed legislation to have mandatory health and safety committees in every workplace in the state of Illinois. And, and the uh, attitude or the opinion of some people is, oh, we could never enforce that. Yeah, but then we tell them, we never enforce any law to 100%. 
it is impossible. I mean, we have laws against speeding in the, in the highways, and I want to see, you know, if the police is able to catch everyone who drives at 70 miles an hour. Of course it's not, you know, but the law exists. So allow people to self-enforce. Allow people to come up and say, hey, according to the law, I have this right and I'm going to do this. So legislation, leadership, uh, education and promotion, uh, and, and legislation, I think that's the, the, the best combination. Sounds great. And, and along the lines of education, um, and Senator Villanueva, you mentioned um, <laughs> earlier on in the first question, the importance of conversations and dialogue such as this, right? But I think it's also important for um, in the Latino community um, to have those conversations with our parents, our tios and tias, our aunts and uncles, who, you know, despite being Latino themselves, sometimes, oftentimes, um, have negative perceptions or have some of these, um, you know, racist perspective against others. Um, and really advocating for youth to be that impetus in the family to really address that topic. And I'm really hopeful um, because I think, you know, with younger folks, folks that I've been in touch with and just like seeing the work that, like Selena, you mentioned, um, a lot of the youth workers just being out there, they, they acknowledge this and they see that it's not about us versus them because collectively we're stronger, we're better together. Um, Selena, do you want to talk a little bit more about um, this idea of potentially youth uh, being able to be this impetus uh, to address racism within the Latino community? Oh, absolutely. I was that person in my family. <laughs> um, you, you, like, and I remember this because I was 15 years old, and I remember my grandmother trying to say something, particularly about dating, and not dating outside of like your race. And I was like, but you taught me to love everybody. And I was like, that's literally, because my grandmother um, helped raise us, because my parents obviously worked two jobs, and you know, we're busy trying to make sure that we had you know, food to eat and, and a roof over our heads. But I remember having this conversation with her and pushing her on this, and that any time that somebody would like, make a joke, would like, get upset and say, well, that's not true, because my, my friends are black, and what you're saying doesn't equal what I know. And so, again, being 15, especially in a Mexican family where your respect is to your elders, um, I think that's where the, the Americanized version of, of what it means to be an immigrant comes into play because, um, you know, like I'm a person that when I still talk to, to people, even if I don't know if they're older than me or not, you know, in Spanish, uh, yo hablo de usted. Like, I'm still very much de usted, and so my staff know this. Like I tell them, I was like, you never like talk to anybody as tú. Like you always give somebody the respect as usted, but um, also don't ever let anybody like you know try to tell you um, or yell at you because we're not about that either. <laughs> but um, you know, I I was very lucky that I think my parents came into this country very young and have always been very progressive in their way of thinking and has both of them before my mother passed was very, very progressive. My mother was all about reproductive rights. My mother, when the Laquan McDonald video here in Chicago came out, was ready to go out into the streets um, because she was just like, he's your brother's age, your younger brother's age. That is somebody's son. That is somebody's baby. And if that was your brother, I would be raising all hell. Um, so I, I was just very lucky that I had parents that also understood and also moved very much the way that we were all moving and siblings because my siblings are all also very much like that but then confronting the ugliness because it is ugly especially in in, in latino and ex families it's a very ugly reality that we have to confront because the reality is we also have that with our indigenous roots um, we have a lot of people who don't want to actually admit that, that we are indigenous. I just did a 23 and me and I my, told my dad, he was like, did it tell you that you're Mexican as heck? Because we already know this. <laughs> but I was like, no, what it tells me is I'm like 48% like indígena. Like I, I have like that. And again, you know, you can see it. Like I, I'm, I'm, you know, brown uh, 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 skin. But, you know, it's confronting the reality of of the ugliness that a lot of people don't want to confront 
but also confronting it in a way where it's just like, look, I, I, I get it and I understand because that's how you grew up, but that is not the way that you need to continue to live your life. Um, that is not the way that you need to continue to exist in this world, especially since we're not in Mexico anymore. We are in the United States. This is a different reality and we are here sharing this land because again, it's indigenous lands and we're all here on, on, on land that isn't you know always ours, especially here in Chicago. But we need to confront these realities. And here's my thing, and this is something that I've said on the floor of, of the State House, and I'll continue to say this again. This is a problem for everybody. It isn't just Latinos, it isn't just Mexicanos. There's a problem with confronting the past in this country as well. Because the reality is, the United States of America was founded on, on or the original sins of the enslavement of African peoples and on the genocide of indigenous peoples in this country. And until we confront these issues, until we confront and say that is a reality, because again, we have like this argument that's happening, like the, this narrative that's happening on a national level of critical race theory. I am a proponent of critical race theory, and I say this because my degree is in Latino Latina studies and African American studies. And I say this as somebody who had this education and this knowledge. The reason why I am the way that I am is because I had incredible people that imparted so much wisdom on my life to understand just because the status quo says it's this doesn't mean that it needs to stay that way. And it's up to all of us to not just educate ourselves, and again, not just with books, but with dialogue, with personal conversations, with friendships, and expanding what we know to be, you know, what our, our norm is, that's the way that we do it. It isn't just someone telling you, oh, you're wrong, you don't know anything, because part of it is also a very much level of love. I mean, and I know Jorge knows this, and I'm pretty sure that Director Story knows this, we don't do our jobs just because we want a paycheck. We do our jobs because there's an inherent love for the communities that we serve. And I think it's the same thing in terms of combating racism, is that there has to be an inherent love to combat the hate, because the reality is love, and again, a whole bunch of hard work, is what's gonna be able to fight that out. Yeah. And um, I'll pass it over. Um, just on, and on that, with, I think, you know, opportunities is extremely important for youth. Mentorship, I've, I've, yep. you know, is a, I'm a very big proponent of ensuring that youth have really good mentorship and opportunities, but I think that's also a two-way side, a two-way mm -hmm. road, right? Where yeah. youth, especially folks now, I think we've seen over the last 10 years or so, um, the youth, like, just not wanting to take the standard and, you know, saying that just because it has been in the past doesn't mean that that's the way that it should continue being moving forward. And really the importance of making sure that youth and their voices are elevated in different dialogues, right? Because in, in different platforms, in politics as well, um, because that's necessary in order to really move forward, in, or, in order to really continue and, and be progressive in that sense of, you know, evolutionary in our values, I think it's necessary for youth voices to be a part of that. Um, uh, Director Story, I wanted to ask you, as far as addressing racism, in the healthcare sector and, and within hospitals, uh, what are some of the things that you think can be done in order to remedy or, or really address that? Or what are some things that you've been able to do um, in the work that you've, that you've done over the last couple of years? Thank you. I think that the, the most important thing that we can do as a people right now is to create a pathway for our children, the youth that are coming behind us to have access to educational opportunities in this healthcare space. It's not just doctors and nurses that work in healthcare today. There's a plethora of jobs in the healthcare industry. Matter of fact, it, we all know that, well, if you don't know, I'll say it, is that the fastest segment where jobs are being created and are growing is in the healthcare sector. And we as a people need to create opportunity and spaces for our children to know that, to know that. And you do that by creating opportunities for them at all levels. I would love to see personally, and I've done this throughout my career, I've always had school-based medical programs. In other words, 
if there was a junior high school in proximity to the hospital that I worked in, I, I established a school medical post where kids had an opportunity every other week to come inside the institution in a structured environment. This was not show and tell where they just walked and say, that's a CT scanner. That's where they do hard catheterizations. No, this was a structured program where they had pre and post tests. They spent a week there, half a day, every other week, because our children need to be exposed to these opportunities so they can see themselves, so they can see themselves, so they can be proud, as one of the speakers said earlier, of themselves, you know, be proud of themselves. That's where the future of eliminating these disparities in our country, it comes from developing a competent workforce that is culturally competent, that is sensitive to the needs of the people in this room and outside this room who look like us. The bottom line is we have to drive those initiatives. And if other people are really interested in, in the narrative that the <laughs> ambassadors has established over the last two days, they would be here. We represent, I've only been in Chicago about 18 months, but I sense that we represent probably more than 50% of the population in the metropolitan Chicago, but where's the media? Where's the mass major news outlets? Where have they been the last two days? Yeah, because as the senator and Jorge said, we cannot allow other people to pit us against ourselves. From the black experience, I can tell you, I'm from the South, in Alabama. There were those who worked in the fields and those who worked in the big house. And what did the master do? He catered to those in the house to control those in the field and vice versa. It's been too long. It's been too long. It's been over 200, 400 years. We have to stop allowing the bosses right. Mm -hmm. right. to divide us. Yep. They're not here because they don't want to see what is happening here, the harmony, the love, as the senator said, that exists in our community. There's much more love than animosity. And I, going back to your question real quick, uh, structurally, yes, we need to create opportunities at all educational levels for young people to access jobs in the healthcare industry, starting in junior high school and high school. In Houston, one of the things that happened over 25 years ago, they built a science high school. You know, we talk about we have magnet or special high schools in all these major cities. I would suggest to you this afternoon that we demand that we have science high school, these STEM programs, built in the medical center, not off some distance. Build the STEM programs in the Illinois Medical District, the space there, so young people can see themselves every day, whether in the eighth grade or 10th grade, walking out and envisioning that in 10 years, I will be that neurosurgeon. Or I was on the CTA with a cardiothoracic, you know, extracorporeal tech. Let them see themselves. We know that everybody wants to be like Mike. Mm -hmm. Because what does the media do? They perpetuate. Yep. They put Mike out there. I love Michael Jordan. We all do. But think about what they have done to us over 400 years. Mm -hmm. We all can't be like Mike, but we can all be that healthcare worker who's culturally competent, who understands our collective pain. That's what we need to do. Structurally put those programs in place. No more policies, build the schools. Thank you for that. Amen to that. Um, and I think, you know, centering equity, um, making equity focal and pivotal to a lot of these institutions and really to all institutions, um, but also acknowledging the fact that we need funding, right? A lot of 
institutions, organizations, community-based organizations that were really the drivers behind this pandemic in helping black and brown communities, helping essential workers. Um, it, you know, the funding is extremely essential. It can't get behind or rallying more behind that. Um, and so, you know, a call to Congress in that sense as well to ensure that the funding that has been coming in since last year, the, the, the funding that started coming in last year and that will continue to come, allow that to be sustainable in order to really make sure that equity is being addressed and is being addressed in a sustainable manner because, you know, some money is a Band-Aid, but if we have sustainable something, policies, uh, funding that is gonna be coming periodically that organizations, institutions can definitely count on for their support, then you know that sustainability is only gonna make them more prevalent. Um, I think I'll do a really quick uh, time check, um, but I'll go on to our last question is, uh, just wanna make sure we have a couple more minutes. All right, uh, sounds good. Well, I wanna close us off by asking each one of you all this question. Um, you know, again, we have seen the devastation that um, this pandemic has done, that COVID-19 has done to black and brown communities. Um, at first, you know, when numbers started trickling in, um, they were showing that black and brown communities were being impacted, you know, morbidity rates and positivity rates as well. And all of the numbers that have been reported are, you know, really underreported as well, especially with the Latino community, um, where oftentimes, as um, Senator Villanueva said, you know, we Latinos are in the shadows, and oftentimes it's because they want to be in the shadows, but oftentimes it's because they just don't know how to identify themselves as in that race question, right? Race, uh, am I white? Uh, am I other? Do I leave it blank? I leave it blank. Leave it blank, right? A lot of folks do. And so making sure that our systems with uh, data collection are set um, so that we get actual and true representations of those that are being impacted. But, you know, being on the front lines um, over the last 18, 19 months, um, everything from operations to uh, COVID-19 tests to vaccination efforts, and really working with a lot of community-based organizations to get the word out of the different resources that are out there. And then the uh, CBOs themselves really stepping up to mobilize and help uh, bridge the divide. Can we deliver groceries to you? Uh, you know, can we help you fill out this application for financial assistance for housing? Uh, can we connect you with a provider? Can we connect you with internet? What do you need for your students, for your children, you know, for, um, in order for them to get back to school? Um, really being out in, in the front lines, in the communities of black and brown folks, uh, we have acknowledged that there has been a lot of devastation. Um, and so I ask you all, what are some uh, lessons left that are left by COVID-19 regarding inequality? But then also, what is it that you're each committed to in doing now and moving forward that the pandemic is not necessarily on the front page every single day, right? Because it's going to see a lot of other conversations already, and, and it seems like black and brown folks are no longer being responded to as they really should. Uh, so those two questions, what are uh, lessons left by COVID-19 regarding inequalities? And what are you personally committed to doing now and moving forward um, that this pandemic you know, will no longer be on the front page? Uh, we'll start off with Jorge, if you want to lead us off on that. Thank you much. Um, it must have been the end of April last year, I think, when I was invited to give a presentation to something called Illinois Unidos. I didn't know what that was. Today, Illinois Unidos is a, an umbrella organization for around 120 uh, Latino organizations, uh, health clinics, community clinics, professionals, all kind of professionals. Uh, but Illinois Latinos, as the rest of the country, and of course the city and the state, were following the data by zip code. And the zip code number one with infections in the city of Chicago was Little Village, precisely, 60623. And I gave a presentation and I said, well, 
it so happens that I know one particular factory where 85 workers got sick. And 85 times 5 yeah, is almost 500 people, because 5 was the rate of infection at that time. Each, each uh, sick person infected other 5. So just multiply, you know, 450 times 5, and you will have 2,500 people sick in Little Village. Because most of these workers in this particular factory, in El Milagro Tortillas, live in Little Village. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to address that. It is fantastic that we have data by race, by age, by zip code, and by I don't know how many other variances, you know, divided uh, 6 to 11, 11 to 19, 19 to 24. Yeah, fine, but how many workers? Because when we were given the instruction to stay at home, it was to prevent large crowds from gathering. Well, guess where the large, large crowds were? In factories, in warehouses. In the Amazon factory right here, on, uh, I mean, warehouse on, on Western Avenue, in El Milagro, and in every other big company in the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. So we need that data. Unfortunately, nobody's compiling that data. Nobody's asking, you know, uh, how many workers in a, a particular company have been vaccinated. We only know that they are 24 to 39, and we are, on, that's the only thing we know. We know that they live on 60608 and 60612, but we don't know where they work. And we continue not knowing. And without that data, we can't work. We can't address the root of the problem, which is still spreading infection in the workplace and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, at least from my perspective, we need that data. We need it. Sounds good. Thank you for that. And yes, a big shout out to Illinois Unidos. That's how you and I met. Uh, Todd got <laughs> to meet a lot of folks uh, yeah. <laughs> in, in the community um, and really addressing the work. Um, so shout out to them as well. So let me tell you that the pandemic, I mean, in addition to obviously like hitting all of us hard, I think I, yeah, the past couple years have been probably some of the most difficult in my life personally and then obviously professionally. Um, I knew at the very beginning of the pandemic the impact that we were gonna have, not just in Little Village, but in the greater Southwest side um, because of the amount of service industry workers that we have on the southwest side of the city of Chicago. Um, in particular, hotel workers, uh, the folks who work at the airports, the, works who, the people who work at factories, like literally the people, none of the people that can work from home. Um, we have a huge amount of people that, that literally, and you see this every morning um, because of like the, the bus lines and the train lines. Um, and then every evening um, at different hours, I remember having this conversation very early on because someone had told me, well, why aren't Latinos, it looks like the numbers in Latino communities are really low. What are you guys doing that you're not getting sick? And I told, and I remember telling this person, your data is wrong. You're asking for race and you're not asking for ethnicity. And I told them, I was like, because on my census, I didn't put down a race because I, I'm, I'm Latina, I'm Mexican, but I'm not like, I don't consider myself to be one of the races that are, that you're presenting me. And like, if it felt like people's minds were blown and they were like, what? And it's like, I know I'm not the first person to tell you this. I don't know why you're not listening, but I also realize the position that I'm in because I'm a Senator and, and it carries some weight. But I remember being on a call where I made some of the staff from the Illinois Department of Public Health cry because I was crying because I was like, you don't care about poor brown people. And I was like, and here's the thing, I'm a senator, but I am a poor brown person. I am from Little Village, I still live in Little Village, and that is, that's where my home and where my heart is, that is where my family lives, that is where my neighbors live. And when I talk about Little Village, I, you know, like, yes, it's the neighborhood, but it's the greater southwest side, it's the people in Brighton Park, it's the people in Pilsen, it's the people in Gage Park, in West Lawn, like it's the people that I know that are waking up every single day to like 
to, to do the work and go to work and live their lives. And I remember literally telling them this and crying and saying, you have no idea what it's like to be the representative of the district that has four out of the five top COVID positive zip codes in the state of Illinois. And consistently, like even to this day, I still represent the area that has the highest number of COVID positivity. And the fact that like I'm in this position and that no one cares, I used a lot of not appropriate words that I won't repeat right now, but the fact that like you all don't care that my people are dying. Like I, I remember this conversation and eventually obviously changes were made and even the applications because it was even the push because they were acting people asking people for their social security numbers. Yeah. And I'm like, do you realize that even to go get a test and you're asking someone for a social security number that they're if they're a legal permanent resident or if they're undocumented, they're not going to go access this test because of a fear that somehow you're going to get them caught up. It was all these conversations, but I remember this because we fought, we fought hard um, to get money to make sure that money was going f directly for cash assistance for undocumented immigrants in the CARES Act funding and in the ARPA money. We fought hard to do all of these things. And here's the reality is the ARPA money, the American Restore uh, the Action Plan, whatever, that they passed, one of the other stimulus, the state of Illinois has not spent the majority of that money. We spent one third of that amount of money for this past uh, fiscal year that we're currently in. And we have two more fiscal years that we're going to be spending that money in. So there's still opportunities for us to be able to say, we think that money should go X, Y, Z into these places. So if you all have great ideas, let me know because I'm open to great ideas. Well, he already gave me one um, or a couple. But you know, it's really important um, to make sure that we're having that dialogue and pushing the conversations because again, if there's an inherent need and like there's something, for example, where we learned this and this was a conversation that we had with the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity on the state level. There's a lot of immigrant and, and even black business owners who don't have bookkeepers. So they're doing their like accounting in notebooks and so when it comes to grants, people, especially unless you're in the nonprofit world, you don't really understand what a grant is. You don't understand that the government is just gonna give you money and that they're not gonna ask you for you to pay it back. Like it's not a loan, it's a grant. But being able to get people ready with their paperwork to be able to actually apply for the, the business programs when they're open well, is, is still a monumental t like task. So being able to take some other programs where we had like, and had been pushing for promotoras de salud, um, you know, in the healthcare field and seeing that and now taking that into the business world and using that type of program, like there's such opportunities. And these are some of the lessons learned is that the way that government has functioned for a very long time is not the way that government can continue to function. And so there are things that are taking shape in terms of how we're interacting as government with people on an everyday basis. And I think that's possibly the biggest lesson learned and the way that we can move forward is that just because it was done a certain way before doesn't mean that that's the way that it needs to continue to be, especially in the face of a pandemic that showed us that this country has more than enough ignored black and brown voices and black and brown communities and it's time for a change. And now, and I know uh, really quickly, I wanna push you on this. I know you're really committed to um, helping out black and brown communities and especially during this pandemic and after this pandemic. But is there one, something that you're committed to particularly um, that you're willing to put your name on it? Oh, I already did it. Um, there's violence prevention money that came from the ARPA, ARPA funds that, uh, that I, like there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so the cannabis bill that we passed a few years ago, mental health money and then money that's coming into our, you know, our communities because of the cannabis, the sale of cannabis, like my commitment is to continue to bring resources into the communities because, and not just Latino communities, but black communities, because the reality is we need it and we deserve it. There you go. We need more uh, elected officials that share that same perspective. Senator Villanova, thank you for that. Um, and Director Story. Thank you. Let me just loop back real quick and talk about something when we talk about structural racism in this country in going back to the 2020 census. And I think we all realize that we've, in present day, the impact of the undercounting of the 2020 census is having on our lives today. We talk about data collection. 
which we're right near scrubbing the numbers from the 2020 census. And because our people were sort of encouraged, not encouraged, there were not resources in our communities to count us, we see that now being played out in this pandemic, meaning the undercounting. Because now that we have access to some of the 2020 data, we are, and this is Cook County, suburban Cook County, we're going back and adjusting our COVID-19 uptake in suburban Cook County. We missed the mark back two and three years ago when the federal government did not allow the resources in our community to acknowledge who we are, that where we exist. And, we're, and unfortunately, we have another decade that we will have to bear that burden of undercounting in our communities. So I just wanted to say that in reference to the challenges that we're having today with COVID-19. As Miguel said earlier in his initial remarks, the question is to us. COVID-19 is no longer the headlines. Sometimes, Chicago Tribune, it's not on the front page. But it, to the senator's point about crying, because I tell you, it breaks my heart. Because I cry also because our people are not on the front page, but they, if you flip to the what? Obituary. Yep. Yep. If you flip to the obituaries right near today, we all know mm -hmm. of friends, loved ones, who are not near on the front page, but in the obituary section. I say this to, uh, it frustrates me when people make the comment that COVID-19 made us all equal. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's just such a misnomer. I could say some other things, some choice yep. words maybe exactly. the senator exactly. would use. Yep. But you know, that when people will say that to our face, and we know that we have always been at the back of the line, mm -hmm. and you're gonna tell me that because of COVID-19, we're all equal now, that I'm at the front of the line, I'm in parity, no. I think that uh, one of the challenges, moving very quickly to your question, more health care workers, community health care workers, were needed on the front line, just like we needed more navigators and door knockers during the census campaign. One of the things that the Cook County Department of Public Health is standing up and building into our structure, and this is be a missed opportunity if it's not in place for the next three, five, 10, 15 years, is having community health care workers who are there continuously. Because if those individuals were baked into our narrative in our community, the hesitancy in terms of trust, yeah. you know, wouldn't have been there. No disrespect to the Illinois National Guards, but if I just arrived here from Alabama and I see an Illinois National Guardsman yep. person, I'm going to hesitate. Yeah. Exactly. I think I'll go home and come back tomorrow. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's all part of the structural racism that the majority doesn't understand that impacts our lives. The undercounting and who's out there representing in terms of health care workers. This goes back to the point of, once again, that we have to have children who are growing up near in our communities to be those influencers, those trusted voices. We want to see them on the major news outlets saying, trust me, take the shot. I'll trust my children. You know, not that I don't trust other folks today. But we have to be more, we don't have to be apologetic we should stop being apologetic for wanting to take care of ourselves and not to be just in the obituary section as opposed to the front page or this pandemic behind us. So one of the things that I uh, will purport to you this afternoon that I'm committed to doing is pushing and establishing uh, a substrate 
if you will, an infrastructure where we have community health workers who are those influencers, who are those trusted voices, because I think we would all concur that we're going to see another crisis in our lifetime. Now, I might be on soft food, and maybe some of the young folks will say, I remember when he said that. But you're gonna, there'll be another crisis in our country. And we need to be better prepared than we were in 2020. And we do that by starting today by challenging the status quo to build in place those trusted voices who are health care professionals, who are community workers. I'm old enough to know that in Alabama as a child, there was health care workers in the public health sector who literally walked the streets. And my first shots came from a nurse who walked and gathered, she would tell my mother, I come from a very large family of 12. So we would have to grab and, but that was a trusted voice. Mm -hmm. That was a trusted resource. So I'm committed working with the department and the president of Cook County, County Health, is to put in place those trusted voices, those community health care workers, whatever we call them. We need to have people who are committed to service, to committed to service. And uh, I would like to thank the council again for this opportunity to be here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to look for the major news outlets. And hopefully somebody will call them before the day is out and say, they missed the great opportunity to serve all of Chicago by not promoting, by missing the promotion of black and brown for the last two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Story, and for that commitment as well, because we do need that pipeline of community health workers, promotoras de salud, to be sustainable, um, because when another pandemic does hit, uh, we need to be prepared. Um, you know, and, and really uh, want to address this uh, really quickly about this notion of when we were in the pandemic, right? A lot of people are perceive this as us no longer being in a pandemic, and we are. We really are. and. If you perceive it in that way, you know, that is a privilege and that privilege should be checked because we're still in this pandemic. People are still dying. It may no longer be in the headlines, um, but you see those obituaries, that's those 20, 40, 60 people that are dying a day by state, by region, those are deaths and those are black and brown folks uh, predominantly that are passing away. Um, but Thank you all so much for a terrific conversation, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Torres Mendivil. Uh, thank you, Consul Sandra, as well. Uh, the, the entire folks here at the Consulado uh, de Mexico and Chicago. Um, and thank you very much to the Cesar Chavez Institute, UNAM, uh, for really being the impetus behind this conversation. <laughs>